Mabrika, everybody, and welcome to the Taino Heritage Camp. I am Kasik Jenna, and today we are going to be joined by Lynn Guitar, who is a researcher and author of children's novels. So I'm going to let her introduce herself and tell you a little bit about herself. So welcome, Lynn. Welcome. Glad to be here. Um, a little about myself. Well, I went back to a university as a 42-year-old sophomore. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, uh, and earned two uh, bachelor's degrees, one master's degree, and one PhD in nine years. <laughs> wow. And all of my research, I'm, I'm an historian and cultural okay. anthropologist, all my research has been on the Taino Indians of the Greater Antilles. And we're, we're, very, we're very blessed to have you in the community because you've put a lot of energy into researching and making sure that we unearth the truth about the Tainos, the details, the finer details as well. Um, <clears throat> have you always been in history? So before the, the, when you went back to university at 42, did you, were you always in history? No, but I've always been a writer. Um, I owned motorcycle shops in Canada. Wow, that's so exciting. What an awesome life. <laughs> that's, that, that's amazing. That's really, really, really amazing, Lynn. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your, your, um, your 10-part series, your books? Yes, it's called Taino Niro, which in English means Taino, Children of the Water. Okay. And it's for readers ages 10 to 110. <laughs> And it tells the story of, um, of uh, Kayabo, a young Taino, and his sister, Anani. And it tells the story and culture of the Taino through their adventures. They are, it's the period, the first eight books take place just before the Spaniards arrive in the okay, country. And then the last two books of the 10 um, take place after the arrival of the Spaniards. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's a great way to access the information which is incredibly important because at the Taino Heritage Camp we do a very similar thing we we create programs that kind of take the the academic papers and the research that people are doing to make them grassroots so that people can access the information so these books are a really wonderful thing that you've done um and we're going to be reading the first book today. The first book is called um, The Legend of the Cave of Nirahu. Yes. Yes, The Legend of, of Nirahu Cave. The Nirahu Cave. Okay. Okay. Let me start. Okay. <laughs> Put the glasses back on. Okay. Looking forward to this. Thank you. Here we go. Kayabo rode his canoa, canoe as hard as he could, for the current was very strong as he approached the mouth of the river. Had he come at the right time? He glanced toward the east. Gwe, the sun, was just rising. Behind him, Karaya, the moon, was a full round ball just about to slip into the ocean. It was the third full moon since the celebration of the shortest night of the year. This was the combination that Arokael, his grandfather, had told him to watch for. The time of abundance for which Kayabo was named. It was the time when for just a few days, immense schools of an uncountable number of seti, small silvery fish that hatched upstream in this river and several other nearby rivers, and swam out to the open waters of the sea. Kayabo hoped to catch as many seti as he could with his new nasa, the net he had woven without any help. He would take them home to feed his family and share with his neighbors to prove that now that he had, had seen 12 years, he could be counted among the men. Why? he exclaimed as a small carré, a green sea turtle, popped its head up directly in front of the bow of his canoa. The carré seemed to look him straight in the eyes and smile. Kayabo nearly tipped over the canoa, trying not to hit it. Turtles did not smile, he told himself, shaking his head as the turtle continued out to sea. I used that for the, il the illustration, my friend Tally Saxton do this. This is the cover, and this is, this is Kayabo, and he's, he's the turtle. There's wonderful. the turtle, okay, and the sun. Beautiful imagery. 
the sun is just rising. Okay, so where is he now? He's almost tipped over his canoe because of the turtles, and the turtles now swimming out to sea. He quickly forgot about the kare as the turquoise waters turned silvery blue because of all the small fish swirling and darting just below the surface. Returning to his home village of Kalea, just, uh, Kaleta, just before Gwe was at its highest point in the sky, Kayabo imagined the hero's welcome he would receive his, because his kanoa was nearly full of the still squirming silvery seti. He dipped several more gourds full of seawater over his precious cargo before braving the white crested waves that crashed upon the beach ahead of him. Limestone rocks sharp enough to cut a canoe in half if the rowers missed a stroke lined both sides of the small inlet. Fighting to keep his canoe headed directly at the sandy shore, Kayabo still had time to glance up and wonder why no one was on shore to greet him except two own dogs. There was no one to help him haul his now heavy canoa onto the sand for safety. Aigwee! Kayabo called out, wishing anyone within hearing a good day as he leaped out of the canoa to guide it as far as he could up the sand alone, helped only by the power of a surging wave. Taigwe, he repeated, cupping his hands around his mouth. Kayabo, shouted Anani, one of his younger sisters, running down the beach toward him. Oh, Kayabo, she cried, tears <laughs> pouring down her face as she threw herself into his arms. What's the matter, he asked, hugging her and gently placing his forehead against her forehead in greeting before holding her out at arm's length and asking again, what is the matter, Anani? It's, it's a rokael, she said, sniffing and trying to hold back her tears. Barra, she blurted out before bursting into tears again. Barra, a rokael is dead. Barra, a rokael barra? How could that be, Kayabo found himself thinking, as he allowed Anani to guide him to the grove of sea grape trees up the hill where their ancestors and deceased loved ones were buried. Just this morning, Arokael had helped him launch his canoa, wishing him good fishing. He was fine then. But there was his body, Kayabo saw, as he and Anani entered the residential area. It was on Arokael's wooden duho, a short-legged stool carved with the head of a kare at the front. There was no mistaking that it was his grandfather, his Arokael, for the ultra-thin body that his two apprentices were carefully wrapping in cotton strips had the black markings of highly detailed back tattoos on its arms, legs, and chest, symbols of the important leader he had been, the Beike of the fishing village. For nearly two generations, his Arokael had been the people's religious leader, healer, teacher, principal artist, and umpire in the game of Bate. The only man as important to the village as his grandfather was Cacique Guabos, the chief. And now Arokael was dead. Bara. Kayabo awoke early and dragged himself out of his hamaca, his hammock, to the door of the boillo, where he lived with his four mothers, three fathers, and 15 brothers and sisters, all of his maternal family, because his, gra his last grandmother had died just after he was born. The days of mourning for his Arokael were over. During those four days, everyone who had known Arokael had walked or come by Kanoa from all parts of the island, as well as from the nearby island of Mboriken, to praise the dead Baike. They talked about his great deeds, his miraculous cures, his skills as an artist, his fame for negotiating with the recently dead, the spirits of the unpredictable Opia and Semi, the spirits including the powerful yet fearful spirits of their founding fathers. Through Arokael's skillful, skillful negotiations with those divine spirits for the past 40 years, Arokael had been able to ensure an abundance of fish, juca, fruit, and healthy babies for his people. Arokael had also helped to guarantee that very few of the men died by drowning, even though they were mostly fishermen, and to keep all of his people healthy. This morning, Arokael's carefully wrapped body would be taken to a nearby cave by two his two apprentices. He would be laid to rest in the darkness among the Opia and Semi, with whom he has spent so much time in fasting, prayer, and negotiation throughout his life. Tonight, there would be a huge areito, a song and dance celebration during which all of Arokael's people and all of the guests who had once known him would commemorate his life and his death. Mm -hmm. 
Why so sad, my son? asked Kamagweja, one of his mothers, tousling his hair as she joined him at the door of their boio. I miss Arokael, said Kayabo, sighing, and turning slightly away so she would not see the tear that escaped down his cheek. I still cannot believe he is gone. Come here, son, said Kamagwaya, leading him to a nearby guava tree and pointing down to an overripe fruit that had fallen to the ground. What do you see there? she asked Kayabo. Looking where she pointed, he replied, A guava rotting on the ground under the tree? No, that is not what is happening, she said in a soft voice. Look again. What you see is a tree that is about to be born from the seed of that fallen fruit. Kaibo knelt to take a closer look. She was right. It could be interpreted from two very different viewpoints. Do you understand now what has happened to your grandfather, asked Kamagoya. He will be reborn, suggested Kayabo, not entirely certain of his response. Han Han, yes, she exclaimed, clapping her hands happily because her son understood so quickly. Arokael is now in, Ka in Kauai Bay, the Taino heaven, deciding mm -hmm. what he will be in his next life. Or maybe he has already chosen and even now is enjoying himself in a new, younger form. Perhaps he chose a body where he will not have to suffer as much as he did in his life as a beike. For the first time in four days, Kayabo was able to shake off his sadness and enjoy the visitor's tales about his grandfather, as well as the ahiako, the pepper pot stew, and cassabe bread that was served later for lunch. The ahiaki was so flavorful. It held the usual chunks of sweet yuca, jautia, mapue, and yame tubers, as well as small pieces of tender corn still on its cob. It also had plenty of the smoked settee that he and other fishermen of the region had caught in abundance. The ahiaco was well spiced with ahies, hot peppers, and the sweet sour vinegar prepared from bekoisi. His mothers had taught him that bekoisi, the juice that had to be squeezed from the grated bitter yuca pulp before making cassabe, was extremely poisonous. He and the other children helped to do the squeezing when they were young by jumping up and down on the branch that ran through the bottom loop of the Sibukan, a large woven tube that held the freshly grated yuca. He had never thought of that as work because it was so much fun, like a tear jar. Mm -hmm. Even now that he was older, he could not understand how the juice of the yuca could be so poisonous if swallowed raw, but so delicious cooked. That evening, for the first time in his young life, Kayabo entered the circle of singers and dancers at the Arito as an adult, while everyone sang the chorus to a new song taught to them by Kamako, one of his grandfather's friends, through the name exchange ceremony of Guatiao. Its verses told the story of how, in the 40 years and more that his Arokael had been Beike, there had always been enough fresh water for the people to drink and enough rain to water the canucos, the gardens. They told of the good fortune that there had only rarely been huracanes, and even those were relatively brief and weak. Everyone knew that the ferocious storms, huracanes, with their driving rains and high velocity, swirling winds sent by the female spirit guaban sex, those winds could last for days, destroying entire villages and tearing out even the tallest trees by their roots. The participants in Narito sang loudly, thanking Rokael for all of this, and kicked high as they danced, linked together arm in arm, following the rhythm of the musicians, the beat of the Mayoakan, the horizontal log drums, and the movements of Kamako, the leader of the song and dance. Another took over as song and dance leader, this time singing a song about Guayona, the very first Beike, and all the adventures that he had. Then there was a song about the four twins who caused the ocean to fill with fish. Another one was about a tiburon that was captured, a shark longer than four men were tall, and another about how the land was formed in the depths of the ocean by a kere that fell from the sky, followed by another and another and another that sat upon each other's backs to create the islands and larger land masses. Most of the adults would sing and dance until dawn, but Kayabo was tired and went to his family's boio. Many of the younger children were already asleep, two or three of them to an amaka. He strung his amaka from the center pole to one of the side poles and stretched out to sleep. As Kayabo slept, one of the most important events of his life took place as if in a dream.
Kaya bo, he heard as if from a distance. It was Uncle Kaya's voice. Mm -hmm. Again, he heard Kaya bo. Kayabo opened his eyes and found himself in a deep green world under the water, with Taraya high above, shimmering through the waves at the surface. Yet he had no trouble breathing. Again, he heard his name, this time from nearby, and the voice sounded familiar. He looked around, and there, floating in front of a nearby reef that glowed in soft colors of yellow, blue, orange, and green, was a young Kare looking directly at him and smiling. Here's an illustration, also by Tally Saxton, of Kayabo underneath the water. In his dream. Love his it. dream. And there's his grandfather. Wow. Hey, his grandfather is now a sea turtle. It looks like the same turtle that met him at the beginning. Oh, oh good guess. <laughs> a good guess. Do you not recognize me, Kayabo? asked the Kare. Hello, Kayel? asked Kayabo. Han Han, said the Kare, moving its mouth and speaking in his grandfather's voice. Kayabo shook his head and pinched his arm. Ouch! That hurt! Was this really happening then, or was it a very realistic dream? Do not doubt what you are experiencing, said Aro Kayel. It is real even though I, I must now come to you in your dreams. Part of me is the kare that you see before you, but I'm still your Arokael, and now I will be your personal semi, your personal spirit guide. A lot of the Taino wore images of their personal semi on mm -hmm. their foreheads, just like you were doing. Arokael continued, part of my spirit will now reside inside your head, joined with you for all your future years as a guis, a living human. Whenever you need, you can seek my advice and counsel. Right now, though, you need to sleep, Kayabo, for your sadness has kept you awake these past four nights. Rest, dear grandson, and no more sad thoughts about me. Kayabo watched as a young Kare smiled warmly at him again, then swam away. He felt the ocean currents rocking him, like his BB, his mother's, used to rock him to sleep when he was a baby. In the morning, he awoke rested and refreshed. Kayabo opened the small bag made from the skin of an utia, in which he had collected multicolored sebas, stones, and he selected a rare deep green stone. He would spend the next two months of evenings around the campfire, carefully carving the image of a kare into the stone to remind him of his, his Arokael, his grandfather, who was now his own personal semi. Now he was truly an adult. Kaya Bo was just as worried as the rest of his people. Five full moons had come and gone since his Arokael had been the fishing village's beike. His apprentices, hi, Rabbit. <laughs> his apprentices were not as skilled as he was in negotiating with the powerful Sami, the spirit guides from the world of the divine. More than 100 sunrises and sunsets had passed without even a hint of rain. This was now the season of much rain, but none came. The river had dried up more than a week ago and their supply of fresh water was nearly gone. Yesterday, his mothers had sent him and his older brothers to the freshwater lagoons, nearly a day's walk away, with dozens of large howled out gourds each in orders to fill them with precious drinking water. But the lagoons were nearly dry too. There was only a scummy little bit of water in the mud at the bottom of what used to be wide freshwater lagoons, water that now smelled bad and tasted worse. Two of his brothers had drunk large amounts of it anyway and were now suffering severe stomach cramps and diarrhea. Kayabo slipped out of his amaka and quietly left the buio, even though it was night, the time when the world belonged to the opia, the spirits of the recently dead who walked about at night in human form. He headed for the water's edge under the light of the stars and the waning moon. Stepping carefully, he crossed the sharp rocks that jutted out into the sea until he reached the end where there was water all around him on three sides. Arokael, he called out, lying down on the rocks and cupping his hands toward the water's surface. Arokael, I need you. Your people need you. He lay there for a while, calling out every couple of minutes. 
A familiar turtle's head broke the water's surface nearby, smiling up at him. Taikaraya, good evening, my grandson, said the kare in Arokael's voice. What is the problem? And here, I'll show it right in the book. Here is Arokael leaning down off the edge of the cliff. And, oh, brilliant. And talking to his grandfather, who's uh, who just climbed to the little And so when he called him, he came. Just like he promised he would. Yeah. Just like he promised he would. Um, Taikaraya, good evening, my grandson, said the Kare in Orokael's voice. What is the problem? Hayabo explained, and the Kare's smile disappeared, replaced by a worried expression. You must tell my apprentices to make your brothers swallow a tea made of the Tawa Tua, Tuba, Tua, the Tau Tua herb, said Orokael, so they will vomit up what is left in the, of the bad water in their stomachs. More importantly, you must find your way to the underground lakes that lie just this side of the lagoons. The Kare swam closer to Kayabo and continued, When I was far younger than you, there was a severe drought such as had never been seen by any living people, just like what you are experiencing now. The Beike of that time, the one who later became my first teacher, made a deal with the Semi and was led to a cave that guards the liquid treasure. Why does no one know about this cave and its underground lakes today, Arokael? asked Kayabo. Because the ancient Beike made a dangerous deal with the Semi in exchange for the water, said the Kare. I was too young to understand much, but it seems that there was a great danger from invading enemies. Strange beings, like us, but with hair growing on their faces and hard shells instead of skin. Like a turtle, as a matter of fact. I wonder who these strange people could be. I wonder if they spoke. Spanish. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we'll see them in the later books though, right? Yeah. The Beike performed a ritual to make sure that they did not come. All I really remember is it had something to do with, a, with cave guardian petroglyphs that are not Makokael. Mm -hmm. But Makokael is always the guardian of the sacred caves, exclaimed Kayako. I'm, I'm only telling you what I remember, said the Kare. The underground lakes are deep within the largest cave of the region. It has many rooms and many entrances, but they are hidden in the depths of a thick forest on top of an elevated ridge. I hope you find it in time to save our people, Kayabo. I will help you as much as I can. Taino tea, may the great spirit be with you. With that, the Kare dove out of sight beneath the water's surface. In the morning, Kayabo told his grandfather's apprentices what had happened to him during the night. They immediately dosed his brothers with Tao Tua and then blessed all three of them with sacred tobacco smoke. Kayabo then sought out Kamagueya to tell her his plans and left with a makuto, a carrying basket, filled with kasabe and smoked fish. He had emptied his ukiya skin bag of his large collection of siba, leaving them behind. In their place, he carried only a stone knife, the greenstone kare that he had carved, and his fire stone. He wore the bag on a cord around his neck. Kamagueya insisted on also giving him a gourd half filled with some of the little drinking water that was left in their boil, which was filled by a long cord. Ready, he set off alone in the direction of the lagoon, out each of the dozens of caves that lay beneath the entire region until he found the one with the liquid treasure. By late afternoon, Kayabo had already entered and left ten caves, all of which turned out to be relatively small. He decided he could not explore all the caves in the region, so he would focus on those that were on higher ground than the others. For Rokael had said the cave he searched for was on an elevated ridge. He sat down on a large rock to take a tiny sip from the precious gourd of water when he heard the crack of a dead stick. What was that? He asked himself. Sitting absolutely still, he listened intently. There it was again. Someone or something was approaching him. Who's there? He called out, looking in the direction of the sound. A small girl stepped out of the shadow of a tree into the sunlight. It was his sister, Anani. What are you doing here, Anani? He asked. <laughs> Following you, she said softly. With a giggle, she added, why should you have all the fun? Fun? exclaimed Kayabo. This is not fun. I'm on a serious hunt for drinking water. I know, 
I heard you last night explaining to Kamigwaya everything that happened, and I decided that you needed my help. Besides, today was supposed to be yet another day for grading Yuka, and I hate that job so much. Look, look at what it's done to my hands. She held them out for his inspection. Her hands were full of small cuts and bruises. I'd much rather be here with you exploring for the secret lakes. Kayabo knew he should send her home, but he really did appreciate the company, especially since he knew he might have to spend several nights alone in these unpeopled lands. He shared his water with her, warning her to take just a small sip, and gave her a little of his cassabe and fish. Then they set out together, exploring three more caves on elevated hills before Gwe began to set. They spent the night on a large pile of dry leaves, listening to lizards slithering through the grasses and to the music provided by the multitude of crickets in the woods around them. All that next day, Kayabo and Anani, Anani continued to find caves on elevated ground, many of them. Most had only one or two rooms, while others had five or six. Some had ancient pictographs, paintings on rocks that indicated that Abiike had used those caves in the past for his sacred rituals. That night, they slept again on a pile of dried leaves, and again they were accompanied by the sounds of lizards and crickets. As Gwe was about to dawn, however, Kayabo realized that there was another sound too. It was the toa, toa of distant frogs. Frogs meant fresh water, right? <gasps> And they were quite a long way from the lagoons. Maybe they were close to the cave with the underground lakes. He excitedly woke up Anani and they set out before dawn, following the toa sound and picking their steps very carefully because the ground under their feet was mostly sharp rock. Just as Gwe rose in all its orange gold splendor, they came to an elevated ridge with a thick forest growing on it. Some of the trees were so tall it seemed they were reaching to touch the sky. Kayabo took his sister's hand and helped her up the hill. There, directly below them in a great circular shadowed bowl within the forest was the gaping mouth of a cave with a huge white stalagmite guarding the entrance. The stalagmite was taller than Kayabo. They entered to the right of the stalagmite, lizards skittering swiftly out of their way and were immediately aware that it was a sacred cave. There was no petroglyph rock carving of Makokael to announce that, but there was such a strong feeling of secretness that both were aware of it immediately and began to speak in hushed tones. Even so, dozens upon dozens of bats, disturbed by their whispers, darted in circles about their head. And here's an illustration of their just, Kayabo and Anani are just inside the entrance to the cave. And here is the very, very large stalagmite that guards the entrance. Here's wow. the step that guards the entrance. It's taller. It's taller than, than, than the children. The children. See, there they are. And what? So this is a real, the, the, that, that cave is a real place in Dominican Republic. Yes, it is. It and is. that's actually what it looks like as well, right? Oh, exactly how it looks. It has that large stalactite. You have to walk down to the bowl in the forest. Mm hmm. Beautiful. Absolutely a beautiful cave. Maybe one day I'll get to visit. Oh, it sounds amazing. It. Yeah. Did you want a tour of it? <laughs> okay. You wait here, Anani. I'll gather up materials to make some torches, whispered Kayabo. While he was gone, Anani's eyes adjusted to the darkness, and she made out a partially lighted archway on the left of the large entrance room. She had to duck through the low archway, even though she was not tall. She entered a circular room and saw hundreds of pictographs on the left and several tunnels. Two tunnels appeared to lead deep into the cave and the one to the left led to another large entrance into the forest. The sunlight was coming from that entrance. She was about to explore the forest entrance when she heard her brother's frightened cry. Anani, he was calling out. She rushed back to the entrance room to assure him she was fine. Then she led him through the low archway and the passageway beyond it that she had discovered. Together, they examined the pictographs, large, clear paintings of sibucanes, tiburones, fish, and water birds of all kinds. It looks like Abiike was worried about his people having enough food and water, said Kayabo. He, or maybe they, probably painted all of these drawings as prayers to the semi. Mm -hmm. What does this one represent, asked Anani, pointing at one that had almost disappeared under a layer of white-colored minerals that dripped down the wall over the pictograph. 
I can't make it out, said Kayabo. Come on, let's see if we can find others that might give us a clue to where the room with the underground lake is. Using his firestone, he lit one of the torches he had made and headed into the darkness, Anani right beside him. To the right was a tunnel that looked interesting, but when he tried to walk in that direction, a bat drove straight at Kayabo, directing them to the more open tunnel ahead. All right, he called out to the bat laughing. We will go that way. <laughs> Do you really think that bat is guiding you? Asked Anani. I do not know, but what does it matter? We might as well go one way as another, said Kayabo. Okay. They stopped to admire a beautiful formation, like a series of small waterfalls off the left of the wide tunnel, then continued on and on. One room led to another, then to another. One was filled top to bottom with stalactites and stalagmites, but there was a small pathway forward on the right. Kayabo stopped to light a new torch from the flame of the first, and they continued deeper into the cave. As they continued forward, the roof got lower and lower. Soon they had to crouch down. Look, said Anani, pointing to a beautiful mineral-colored column sparkling in the distance. Just ahead, there were some large flat surface stalactites filled with pictographs. They hurried to examine them. This looks like a man climbing up or down a large tree trunk, said Kayabo. Remember when I fell from the cliff into the sea and could not climb back up? Two of our fathers and the rest of the fishermen who had not yet left that day cut down a large tree, trimmed off its branches, and lowered it down so that I could climb up. Mm -hmm. Just then, a bat flew at them, circled around, and came back to them again, as if trying to drive them back toward the sparkling column they had admired. They went that way and discovered a tunnel that spiraled, leading them down and down an incline. Suddenly, there was blackness instead of a wall on their right. Kayabo started to walk in that direction, holding the torch out in front of him to see better, when a bat swooped at him again, driving him back, but not before he had glimpsed a dim light way, way below. More carefully now, lying on his stomach and ordering Anani to stay back against the wall, he inched toward the darkness. Far below Kayabo, his flickering torch reflected off the surface of water. Yeah. The children followed the spiral down and down some more, coming to an opening into the forest. The water that I saw is still off to the north, said Kayabo. He put out the torch and they walked around the outside of the cave in that direction. Not very far away was another large cave entrance with several huge frogs crouched in the shade of a rock. Kayabo and Anani climbed down the rocks into the opening and discovered a small triangular sculpture of the spirit of Jokahu Bawa Maro Koti on a natural shelf looking down at them. The most powerful Taino spirits, Jokahu controlled both Juka and water. This must be the guardian of the underground water, said Kayabo, one of the two cave guardians that Rokael spoke about that are different, that are not Makokael. And here, is an image a oh, wow. of the semi of Yukahu. 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 See, his mouth is open so he can eat the dirt and grow strong. Oh, wow. So and that's the semi of Yuka and, the, and water. And there was a smaller one of this mm -hmm. um, sitting on a rock. And right below it is the cliff that leads down to the underwater cave. Oh, wow. So there really is one there, and it was a guardian. It was not Mokokael. Oh, and we actually found that. Archaeologists found that. Wow. Found oh, it. you found it. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. It wasn't separate like that. It was part of a big flat rock, and it was carved right out of the rock that was there, sitting on top of the flat stone. Excited, they both nearly ran down the tunnel, pulling up short at the edge of another black drop-off. Oops. Lying down to see over the edge, Anani said, look, there's a tree trunk, just like in the pictograph. Its top reached to just below the edge of the drop-off. Kayabo ordered her to stay on guard there in the cave. It may not be safe, he explained when she protested. Then he inched feet first over the edge and climbed down the trunk with a freshly lit to torch. Several minutes later, he called up, there are two huge pools of water down here. 
Hun Hun, it's fresh water and it is delicious. Throw me down the gourd. Then he climbed back up, offering the gourd full of water to his sister, who drank thirstily. Both of them then climbed down and took a brief, refreshing bath in the cool waters before returning to the village with their good news. Swimming in the water of that cave is just amazing. <laughs> oh, hey, you're making me jealous. <laughs> Over the next couple of days, Kayabo and Anani led all of the men, older boys and girls, and many of the women of their fishing village back and forth to the cave with the underground lakes. Everyone filled gourd after gourd full of the life-giving treasure, fresh water, and mm -hmm. carried it home. With the fresh water, their brothers recovered, as did others who had become ill from drinking bad water. Children were sent to pour gourds full of fresh water around the corn and yucca and other plants in the Kanuko. Mm. lifted up their drooping leaves and began to recover from the long drought too. On the fourth day after their discovery of the underground lakes, Guavos, their cacique, called for an arito, a celebration of their rescue from the drought. Even though Anani was only 10 years old, she was invited to dance that night. The first song that was presented was in honor of Kayabo and his sister. The song told of their dangerous journey to find the cave with a hidden liquid treasure. Mm -hmm. a from now on would be called the Cueva Nira, Children of the Water Cave. Late that night, just before Gwe arose, Kayabo climbed out onto the rocks of the inlet again, lay down and called out to his grandfather, Arokael. The now familiar smiling turtle's head rose above the surface. I have come to thank you, grandfather, said Kayabo. Not at all necessary, replied Arokael. I thank you for being brave enough to suffer danger and risk your life to save your people. You are already a great leader and will become an even greater leader. He laughed, continuing. And I think you have created a new legend that will be famous among our people, the legend of the Nirau Cave. Late that afternoon, clouds covered the sky and a light rain began to fall after all oh, those. Wonderful. It colored everything a misty green like it was beneath the sea. Thank you again, Arokael, Kaibo said aloud, looking toward the sea. He was grateful that the drought was over and wondered what other adventures might lie ahead of him. Well, I know it's going to be lots more adventures and I'm really looking forward to hearing the rest of them as well. Thank you so much, Lynn. It's an exciting and informative book, which is so great. Like, it's very difficult to get that balance sometimes. And it was really 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 interesting and a great read we look forward to having you back next week yes or the second book what is the second book called ah, the second book is called no more greeting juca and it features anani <laughs> All 10 of the books both anani and kayabo are in them okay but first book features kayabo the second one anani then kayabo then anani then kayabo then anani okay wonderful Really, really, really cool. Really cool. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing more about a nanny's story because I know that she hates grating yucca. <laughs> <laughs> so we will see you next week. Thanks everybody for joining us. If you want copies of the book, we actually have them for sale in the Tiny Heritage Camp bookstore. Um, and the link is down below so you guys can see it. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you can get notifications of when um, we we'll get more stories and more stories from Lynn Guitar. Thank you so much, Lynn, for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, take care.